So let us join in our call to worship. Bless God, O friends, with all our strength. Bless the holy name. Bless God, O friends, and never forget God's gifts. Forgiveness flows into healing, tireless goodness and joy, strength and youth of the eagle's flight. Vindication and justice for all those oppressed, liberation from bondage and guidance for the way, unending mercy, steadfast love. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's love toward those who are faithful. As a parent has compassion for children, so God has compassion for us. Let us pray. Compassionate One, lover of goodness, patience with sinners, Draw near to us, surround us with your confidence in good news, that you love us as parents love their children, that your mercy is boundless and generous, that you beckon us always and will wait forever as we find our way back to you. Open our hearts to receive your compassion and then show us how to forgive so that we may be vessels of resurrection hope in our troubled world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join together in a time of prayer. Loving God, as the seasons change and as we try to get back to more normal schedules, we come before you this morning asking for your care for our loved ones in need. We pray for those who are sick, particularly for Janice and John and Joan, for Don and Bonnie and Jerry. We pray also for those who mourn. We pray for Luann and her family on the passing of her sister. We pray for Shelley's family as her father, Fred, nears the end of his life. Be with them comfort them, and give them hope. Be with all those who are sick. And please be with all the doctors and nurses and others who care for the sick, particularly in this time of pandemic as we continue to see the struggles that people have. Lord, we also pray this morning for those out in the West whose lives and homes are threatened by the fires. Be with them, help them protect each other, help them find hope, even in the face of destruction. And Lord, we pray for those across our nation and around the world who seek justice. We pray that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them hope, and that you would challenge us all to open our ears to the call for justice. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have two readings today. The first comes from Genesis chapter 50, starting at verse 15. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, we are here as your slaves. 
But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. And our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, starting at verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how many, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle account with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents, which was an awful lot of money even then, was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will do also to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to see so many of you back here. The weather has felt like fall. I'm not quite ready for that, but it's certainly coming, and I understand that uh, the Bills are playing today, so I guess it really does start to feel like fall. And in some ways, it does feel like we're getting back to normal. We've shifted back to 10.30 worship time. The kids are in school, whatever that means. Ish, yes. And of course, this week, we had the somber moments as we recalled September 11th. Hard to believe that it's 19 years since it happened. Last week, we talked about reflecting on these last six months of pandemic, what has happened so far and what comes next. And that's, I think, still something important to keep reflecting on. Let's face it, we've endured a lot, and we've found ways to survive and even try to adapt. But there's another side, the level of stress. I've often heard, you've probably heard the stories too, of the people that managed to do amazing things in that moment of emergency, when the stress and the adrenaline takes over and they can find strength they never thought they had. And that's good in the short term. But over time, that continued stress can hurt you. And let's face it, the last six months have been full of stress. And people are reporting trouble sleeping, other health issues. That constant stress can hurt you. We need to find ways to deal with it, and healthy ways, I should add, to deal with it. We've also heard different kinds of analogies about how to think about this. Almost every week I hear someone say, both in terms of the pandemic in general and for those of us that are teachers, that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And that's certainly a good reminder. If you're running a marathon and you start out 
at your absolute fastest pace, you're not going to make it. So it's an important reminder, and I myself have not run a marathon. My friends who have done it can verify that that's true. But at the same time, I think maybe the marathon analogy doesn't quite work, and I'll come back to that. You also hear some people say, well, we're all in the same boat. And I commented on this a couple weeks ago that, well, actually, we found that some people during this pandemic are struggling just on rafts or on boats that are leaking, and some of us do have more resources. Those of us that have jobs that we can work from home, as frustrating as it and challenging as it may be for parents to be working from home while their kids are taking school, that's still an advantage over the parents that suddenly have to figure out ways for their children to be home while their parents work. But if we use that marathon analogy, most people who choose to run a marathon prepare for it. You don't just wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm going to run a marathon today. That just wouldn't work. You prepare. You know what you have to do to survive. And in most races, the point is to keep going and to finish. But many people are learning that in this current situation, part of what we need to do for survival is to stop sometimes and care for ourselves, even as we're working to care for others. So I was thinking this weekend about what other analogies might work. Most of us have gone on road trips. And I don't know if your family's like mine, but when we've gone on a road trip, we do a lot of planning. And when the kids were little, we also packed a lot of stuff. We could be going away for just a weekend, but it felt like we were packing for Mount Everest. But road trips also usually involve stops along the way. Again, with children, many stops along the way, but there are chances to rest. There are, of course, also those unplanned road trips. When you get the phone call saying somebody's sick and you have to get in the car, no packing, nothing, with the clothes on your back, and drive to get to your destination. Certainly some people are having to do that right now with the fires out west. I heard on a, read on a local Facebook group about a family here that has relatives that have come out here from Oregon with their little children, and so they were asking for help finding car seats and bikes for the kids to use while they were here because, well, that was one of the least important things for the family to try to pack as they left their house. Or then there's the emergency evacuations, like from Hurricane Katrina, where you see on the news all the cars backed up on the highways and where sometimes... If you remember those pictures from 15 years ago, if the car breaks down, it just gets pushed off the road because everybody else has to get out. To be honest, analogies fall apart if you push them too far, but I think our current situation has a little bit of each of these. It certainly was unplanned. If you had asked most of us in January if we thought we would be going through this, we would have probably laughed and said, well, you're just crazy. It's unplanned. Everybody is facing it at the same time, but the struggles and the individual challenges are different. And it is ongoing, and we have to pace ourselves. But here's where the important part comes. Now that we're on the trip, what can we do to make it more survivable for ourselves and for others? Now, you may be wondering where I'm going with this. You may be wondering if I've painted myself into a corner with all these analogies. Boats and storms and races and cars and disaster movies. My point, and I do have one, is that despite the challenges and losses, we've made it this far because we've worked together. We've made sacrifices. Social distancing, isolation, masks, risking economic losses and limiting our visits to loved ones, even adjustment to school and other activities. 
We've made them, not because we're happy to make them, but because we've done it to protect each other. We've survived because we are trying to work together, and we need to keep thinking about how we can do better. Keep thinking about the people that are left out of the current structures. In recent weeks, we've talked about parts of the Joseph story. How he reconciled with his brothers who hurt him so deeply. And this week, we heard the end of that. And I'm not sure, but as I was reading it this morning, I was thinking, I don't fully trust his brothers there. Did their father really say that to them about them reconciling? Or did they just sort of figure, well, we, we don't trust Joseph, and so well, we, we'll, we'll just tell him Dad said this, because Dad's dead now, and he's got to honor Dad's memory. Um, maybe you've experienced people who, no matter how many times you try to be nice to them, they always assume that you've got ulterior motives. And sometimes it's because they're the ones that they always have ulterior motives and they always have some scheme in their minds and so they can't imagine that other people wouldn't also be scheming. But Joseph takes the high road and he does forgive them. And as I've said many times before, he says God planned all this for good. Whether God actually planned it, whether God meant for Joseph to suffer, whether God means for any of us to suffer, we do have the choice, like Joseph did, whether to return evil for evil or to take a horrible situation and try to make something better. And this week, in the Gospel reading, Jesus talks about forgiveness. Peter has what comes across as a little bit weird question. How many times must I forgive my brother? He's clearly been thinking about this, and maybe this isn't just a random question, but maybe he's been keeping a list of grievances and wants to know how much longer he needs to keep forgiving. I think many of us can relate. How often do we keep forgiving? How often do we let someone hurt us? Do we have to forgive seven times? And I bet Peter was keeping count. And Jesus' answer is no, 77 times, or the notes in the translations indicate that some translations phrase it as 70 times seven. Seven times, 77 times, 490 times. That's an awful lot. I'm pretty sure here that Jesus is not being literal. He's not saying that once you reach 491, you can stop forgiving. I'm pretty sure that he's giving this outrageously high number as an exaggeration. So high that even the person who has the strongest memory of grievances would have lost count long before then. When Peter asks, well, Lord, if another member of the church Some translations phrase it as if a brother sins against me. And some people try to parse this and say, well, okay, so we forgive our family members, or maybe we forgive our church members, but those other people we won't forgive. But I think, based on other things in the Bible, that it's pretty clear that Jesus intends that forgiveness to be widespread not just limiting it to certain people. And of course, sometimes the pain of betrayal is strongest when we feel that our own loved ones have betrayed us. And he goes on with a story. A story of a king forgiving someone's debts, someone's huge debts. And then that man turns around and does not forgive a much smaller debt. There's a couple of things I want to highlight about this story. The one is that the man who chose not to pass along the forgiveness did get punished. But part of the reason is because 
Everyone else around saw this, saw the injustice of it, and did make sure that something happened. Forgiveness is an important thing. Forgiveness is a step towards rebuilding a relationship. Forgiveness should not be something done casually, should not be something asked for if the person asking for forgiveness is not willing to actually repent. If you ever had someone do something to you and say, oh, sorry, no big deal, right? It's not really their place to say whether it's a big deal. To say, I'm sorry, I realize I did something wrong, how can I fix this? is very different from saying, you know, oh, it's no big deal. Unfortunately, too often in our society, too often in our families, we let people get away with really fake apologies. Like the politicians sometimes, well, mistakes were made, um, not actually acknowledging what they had to do with it. That parable about forgiveness ties it in not just to individual debts or grievances, but also an expectation of us forgiving each other, just as is also echoed in the Lord's Prayer. Forgiving and reconciling help us rebuild communities. The sincerity, though, is important. And that's why it's interesting and important to remember that this passage in Matthew comes after Jesus' talk about what you do when a member of the community does something wrong. That first you try to speak to them individually, and if they won't listen, then you bring in others. So it's not saying that you let people get away with bad behavior, but that when they seek forgiveness, you should forgive them. But this is where it's important to keep the community focus. It's not just about me. It's not just about my family. It's about everyone. It's about becoming aware, like the fellow servants did, that some people are suffering. Becoming aware that even in our own situation, some people are having it harder than others. And also recognizing that sometimes that suffering is, just, is not just a coincidence, but has been caused by the actions of people or by the structures of our society. And so forgiveness and reconciliation involve not just talking about the specific incident, but looking at the larger picture and looking at how we may have a role in it. A fellow pastor posted something this week talking about African communities and their approach to justice and reconciliation. Now, I'm sometimes uncomfortable with those posts. They, they often go around on Facebook, you know, the, the Native American man talking about each of you has two wolves inside and everything. And some, sometimes those stories are useful illustrations, but sometimes I think they're taken out of context or they're sort of risking misunderstanding or oversimplifying somebody else's culture. But the concepts in that post were important. The idea was that when you deal with wrongdoing, you recognize the harm and the impact, not the act, not just the act itself. And you recognize that wrongdoing disrupts entire families and communities, not just hurting an individual. And it also talked about how the family of the wrongdoer plays a role in seeking reconciliation. And that reconciliation rebuilds the whole community and involves reintegration of the wrongdoer into the community. That is the ultimate result of so many of Jesus' teachings, and healings and miracles of bringing people back into community. And so when we speak of forgiveness, it's not just 
saying bygones will be bygones, but actually trying to rebuild and make even better our community ties. So in these last months, both from the pandemic and in terms of news about how people have been treated because of race, gender, nationality, many of us are becoming aware of suffering and injustice. And this week's gospel passage and last week's remind us of the importance of forgiveness. But forgiveness paired with taking responsibility for our actions in hopes of building a better community and being aware, as Jesus' parable says, that we are all given second chances and I guess even 470th, no, 490th chances. I can't even do my math. This is an important message all the time but particularly in the middle of a pandemic, where we have to figure out how to work together for the sake of everyone. A message that's also important as we prepare for communion. Jesus sets the table where we dine today. Jesus' welcome extends to all of humanity. People of all ages, of all genders, of all cultures, of all economic conditions are welcome here. No one can earn a place at this meal, but we come of our own choice. You need only desire a deeper relationship with the risen Christ. Bring your hopes and your history your deliberations, and your doubts. Come as your whole self. May God be with us. Let us lift our hearts up to God, and let us give thanks to God Most High. Creating God, we give thanks that you brought this world and all of humanity into being, breathing life into us. You show yourself in each face we encounter each and all created in your image. We thank you for your covenants. You taught us how to serve you and how to honor each other. To bring us into relationship with you, you sent us prophets and teachers. We offer thanks that when we ignored your embrace, you persisted in reaching out to us. We thank you most for the life and ministry of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Christ taught us that nothing, not even death, can separate us from you. Through your Holy Spirit, you breathe through us, gathering us as the church. Thank you for continuing to bring us together that we may celebrate you. We join our voices with all of creation to praise you, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God of hosts. We recall that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus brought his disciples together. And after the meal, he broke the bread, blessing it and sharing it with them, saying, this is my body broken for you. And after the meal, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. So now, and I have to grab my bone. We have our individual cups. So I invite you to open it. Take the wafer. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of him. And this is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Drink it in hopes of new covenant, of new life in Christ.
Gracious God, we thank you for this meal and for all of the ways that you nourish us. Grow in us that we may nourish others. Sustain us as we press toward the goal of your call in Christ Jesus. And let us go forth to forgive as we have been forgiven. Seventy times seven. Freed of the paralyzing burden of sin in order to do justice, love mercy, walk confidently and humbly with God. Amen.